There's been a huge amount of research done on testosterone and on a thing called precarious manhood, but you don't hear a word of it. You don't hear anything. Why? Because the media, along with academia, are all focused on socialization is the only thing that makes us how we are. I mean, really, when you think about it, that's pretty crazy. I mean, it, it's not simple. It's not like, oh, it's all biology. It's like biology, it's socialization, it's genetics, it's family of origin. There's all kinds of things that make us who we are. But today's world leaves out biology completely. And so most of you probably haven't heard the things we're going to talk about today about testosterone, because it's some fascinating stuff. And it's important for men to know these things about themselves. Why? It's important to know because it keeps us from the pull of gravity that testosterone gives us back into a blue pill world. That's what testosterone does. It's gravity back towards the blue pill world. So we need to be conscious and aware of our biology. So uh, our speaker here right now, sitting behind me, uh, is Tom Golden. He is a therapist with a 30-year track record of wrongfully telling men and boys that they are not the source of all the evil in the world. And despite his clearly misogynist agenda, he has been engaged to give workshops in Australia, Europe, Canada, and the U.S., and has even been featured on several male supremacist and alt-right media outlets, including CBS, ESPN, The New York Times and the Washington Post. Tom has held the position of vice chairman of the deeply bigoted Maryland Commission for Men's Health, a body that the Southern Poverty Law Center has somehow neglected to list on its totally legitimate hate map. Uh, his website and YouTube channel both share the dubious title, Men Are Good, which any decent and compassionate person would rightly view as the despicable lie it is. Given all of that, we are quite confident here that uh, he abuses his dog. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Tom Golden. There we go. The first thing I want to say is, men are good. <laughs> men are good, and that is something the media will not tell you. They won't tell you that. Oh, boy. In fact, you know, <laughs> these are supposed to come up one at a time, so the element of surprise has been taken away. But we'll start at the top one. Living ain't easy in a red pill world. Why is it not easy? One of the main reasons it's not easy is in a blue pill world, guess what happens? Men gauge their value based on what they do, based on, on their accomplishments, based on their successes. That's where they see their value. In a red pill world, we hopefully have moved into a space where we see our value is in our being. No longer are we pulled back by gravity into this blue pill world that says you're supposed to be doing things all the time. You're supposed to be successful, et cetera, et cetera. So this whole shift, I think, has, has changed my way of thinking, and I think it's changed some other people's ways of thinking. And we're looking now not just at the places where men face discrimination, hardship, and lack of choice. We're looking now in ways that we can help men enjoy their lives in a different kind of way. And doing that, one example is a, uh, a little YouTube series I've done called Feeling Good in a Red Pill World. And it's all about helping men to feel good in the red pill world as we are today. And Paul Elam and I have done, uh, come on, there it is. We've done a, a Patreon and Subscribestar site, Red Pill Relationships. It goes through all kinds of ideas about helping men deal with red pill knowledge in a blue pill world and a blue pill relationship. And it's fascinating stuff. But all of these things are kind of focusing on helping men enjoy their lives as they are, not just look at what the discrimination has been against them. OK. Um, one path to feeling good is to know thyself. There's lots of research, but and guess what the but is? The media won't tell you what that research is. There's been a huge amount of research done on testosterone and on a thing called precarious manhood but you don't hear a word of it. You don't hear anything. 
Why? Because the media, along with academia, are all focused on socialization is the only thing that makes us how we are. I mean, really, when you think about it, that's pretty crazy. I mean, it, it's not simple. It's not like, oh, it's all biology. It's like biology, it's socialization, it's genetics, it's family of origin. There's all kinds of things that make us who we are. But today's world leaves out biology completely. And so most of you probably haven't heard the things we're going to talk about today about testosterone, because it's some fascinating stuff. And it's important for men to know these things about themselves. Why? It's important to know because it keeps us from the pull of gravity that testosterone gives us back into a blue pill world. That's what testosterone does. It's gravity back towards the blue pill world. So we need to be conscious and aware of our biology and how it impacts us as men. And there's been a whole bunch of stuff done. Hey, you. Yes, you watching this video. Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again, or for the very first time, with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind-the-scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries, like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never-before-seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. And here we have them all listed already. We have three floods of testosterone. Did you know that? Three floods of testosterone. The first flood is in utero. Tiny little baby. The baby is about as big as one of those pecans. But at that time, two months in utero, the baby's brain is flooded with testosterone. The male baby's brain is flooded with testosterone. Some females, mostly males, flooded with testosterone. What in the heck does it do? Scientists have done a lot of work with this. Well, they found it does a lot of things. One is it changes our gender identity. It impacts our gender identity. That is, do we think we're a man or a woman? This is in utero. Sexual orientation. It impacts whether we want to sleep with men or women. This is in utero. This is testosterone flooding the brain of little boys in utero. It changes your face. They now know that the more testosterone you get in utero, the more masculine your face is going to look. Isn't that interesting? The less testosterone you get in utero, the less masculine your face is going to look. There's all kinds of things that they're finding out. I mean, they haven't really scratched the surface with this stuff. So what we're talking about now is just the beginnings. But one of the things is that the, uh, we won't go there yet, the system's brain. You know, there's a guy named Simon Baron Cohen, and he's done some fascinating research on this testosterone flood. And it turns out, in England, where he's from, the hospitals save the amniocentesis samples. You know, amniocentesis is when they put the, the <clears throat> needle in the belly and they pull out some, a sample of the, of the fluid, the amniotic fluid. So he found out they did this. What he did was he got lots of these samples and he measured them all for testosterone. And then he connected those with the children they later became. I think they were like three or four years old at the time. And there's a lot of them that he did. He came up with all kinds of fascinating stuff about, okay, what's the difference between someone who gets a lot of testosterone or a little bit of testosterone in utero? And he came up with this idea that when you get a lot of testosterone in utero, it's likely you're going to have what he called a systems-oriented brain. Your brain is going to want to think in terms of systems. It's going to want to take things apart. It's going to want to put things together. It's going to, what happens if I take this one piece out? Think Legos, right? Legos! Boys love Legos! Yeah! But girls, some girls like Legos too, and that's fine. Some girls get a lot of testosterone in utero. And here's what's fascinating. The girls who get a lot of testosterone in utero, what do you think happens to them? They're very much like the boys. In fact, the, um, well, we'll talk about the way they play in just a minute, which is one of the main factors that, that happens with these girls when they 
move into this place. We call them tomboys. Those girls who got this flood in utero, we call them tomboys. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, Simon Baron Cohen's stuff and the uh, things we're talking about with the brain, it's not binary. It's not black and white. Some men will have it some way, some will have another way, some women will have it this way. So we're not talking about all one pile and another pile over here. What we're talking about is a standard deviation of two for this. This is a, a chart that shows the standard deviation for height and women and men. The women, you can see, are shorter. The men basically are taller. But there's a lot of taller women and there's a lot of shorter men. So it's not like it's one way or the other. This is all gray. But we've got to understand the gray. We've got to take it and understand it as it is. And that there are majorities in there. Some of the gray is important for us to know about. OK, where do we go? Um, aggression. They found the testosterone flood, the more testosterone flood you have, the more aggressive you'll be to a certain degree. The difference, I think, the D equals 1.8, for those of you who know what D is. And it's basically a little bit less uh, than the height. The height is like D equals 2. So it's about the same as the height. And I think the aggression thing changes so that as boys mature, it goes down. It get, gets more equal. But the younger boys have more of the aggression. Um, it does this thing called testosterone priming. Whereas at two months in utero, the testosterone flooding through the brain, it, it, it starts to sensitize all of the receptors in the brain for testosterone. So later in life, when men get a certain amount of testosterone, boom, those receptors are ready to hit it. You know, it's like it, it's ready for us. And then the play behaviors, which is probably one of the most fascinating things. You know, we play differently, and the differences in the way we play start in utero. They start in utero. How do boys and girls play differently? Boy, boys prefer trucks, right? And girls prefer dolls. Have you heard about that? Have you seen that before, the boys like trucks? Yeah. And guess what? They did research that showed, oh, boys like the trucks and the girls like the dolls. And the socialization zealots said what? Oh, no. They've been socialized. So they did it with four-year-olds. Oh, no, they've been socialized. They did it with, like, two-year-olds. The two-year-olds love the trucks, and the, and the girls love the dolls. Oh, no, it's socialized. So one of my favorite researchers, Melissa Hines, did this great study. She said, OK, we'll try something different. And so what did they do? They ran the exact same experiment with rhesus monkeys. <laughs> and guess what they found? The rhesus monkey males loved the trucks. The rhesus monkey girls love the dolls. So I think she, I can hear her say to the other researchers, you know, socialization, question mark? I don't think so. OK, boys, by the time they're three years old, prefer to play with boys. Did you know that? By the time boys are five years old, it's a three to one ratio. By the time they're, what is it, eight years old, it's an 11 to one ratio. Boys like to play with boys, and girls like to play with girls. And the girls have, what, they have, girls have uh, just one or two friends, but they're deeper friends, they're kind of intimate kind of friends. But what do the boys like to do? They like coalitions, right? They like to play in teams. They like the team sport stuff. And boys have to learn how to have some skill that the team needs. I remember one time this, this baseball team said, we need a catcher. I couldn't play catcher. But I said, I can do it. I can do it. I can play catcher. And I learned on the fly, right? I learned on the fly. Right? Interesting stuff. Boys need to learn how to be able to have a skill that the team needs. They also learn how to daggone accept a boy they don't like for your team if he's going to help the team win. That's a very important skill that boys learn in these coalitional games early in life. They learn how to tolerate the boys they don't like in order for their team to win. I can remember a lot of that, eh? OK, come on now. The second flood of testosterone. Mini puberty. Right after the little boy is born, <laughs> he gets this flood of testosterone between the first day and the first two months, I think it goes up until. And they still don't, they're studying this more, but they still don't know a whole lot about what goes on with it. But one thing we do know is the boys get a lot of erections. I mean, any parent of a little boy knows that right that first month, bing, you know, you change that diaper, there it is, strong. And you think, what's he thinking about? Yeah. <laughs> so the erections come, and it masculinizes the brain. That's what they talk about, is that it masculinizes the brain. And they're literally talking about how this changes the physical structure of the brain. You know, we know now that some structures actually change. And here's the research stuff. Long-term testicular functions and sperm production are regulated. 
whatever that means. Okay. And then at puberty, you know, they thought for years and years that um, testosterone was related to aggression. Alan Alda started us off. What did he say? He said, oh, men are testosterone poisoned, right? Have you heard that before? Now what have we got? Now, in the last 10 years, and you won't hear this from the media, they've changed 180 degrees. They now say that testosterone's primary function is striving for status. Striving for status, wanting to win, wanting to compete, wanting to get in there and do the job well. That's what testosterone does. Isn't that fascinating? This is the kind of thing we need to teach our young men. It's the kind of thing we need to teach our boys. That there's, there's, they're gonna hit this hormonal stuff that comes up and it's gonna tell them, compete, get in there and win. I mean, how many times have you heard women say, all he wants to do is win. All he wants to do is win all the time, compete, compete, compete. That's because he's got this juice that's telling him to do that. He wants to strive for status. And right about the time, 12 or 13 years old, boys start striving for status in a different kind of way. You know, before that, when we're little guys, you know, we don't strive quite in the same way. And we're also kind of more easygoing in some ways, right? I remember when I was eight or nine years old, I could cry and cry and cry. My baseball team lost, I'd cry, oh, 12 years old, no more crying. And we know now that testosterone shuts down the tears. It slows down the tears, and if we have enough time, we'll talk a little bit about how testosterone does more than that. It also impacts our capacity to articulate our feelings when they're in the throes of feeling them. This is why in therapy, over and over again, I'll have a man and a woman in therapy, and she's talking about how she feels, and she'll turn to her husband and she'll say, what do you feel? <laughs> what does he say? Like, um, well, um, um, because testosterone is slowing that down. Why? Why would it do that? And it's fascinating to think about. Why does it do it? Think about evolutionarily. You know, men had to guard the perimeter. Do you want someone on the perimeter emoting? Do you want him out there talking about feelings? No, you want him to pull a frickin' trigger. You know, that's what he's got to do. Do you want a policeman when he goes to an accident to start crying? No, no, you want him to do his job. And so men are geared to do their job first, then deal with the aftermath later, you know? Okay, um, it does lots of other stuff. Increases risk taking. When you were 13, guys, you started taking more risks, right? And it was fun. Fear reduction. You took those risks because you didn't get afraid in the same way. You know, your fear came down. So think about it. Strive for status, risk taking, fear reduction. What does that do to a job applicant? I'd say if someone has those kind of qualities, that's someone I want to hire, All right? Threat vigilance, oh God. Threat, this is a fascinating one. Threat vigilance is another piece of testosterone. And here it is. Threat vigilance says, if you have status and someone challenges your status, you need to fight back. That is threat vigilance. So men are geared to fight back if someone challenges their status. Have you seen that before? Have you seen that in bar fights? Man, you get these guys who are juiced up with alcohol and, and they're gonna, someone's gonna challenge their status. Oh, you suck, you do this, you do that, boom. You know, they've, they're geared to have to respond to that threat. It takes a mature man to kind of tone that down and say, ah, oh, I'm walking out of here, getting out of here. But it's part of our juice, it's part of us inside that we have this threat vigilance thing that says, protect your status at all costs. Isn't that fascinating? And stress resilience built into testosterone, they've now found, is this stress resilience. So it's like it brings down the stress. What a hormone, isn't that incredible? Okay, oh yeah, these studies have confirmed that an account of testosterone as simple as uh, talking about aggression, I can't read it. I should read it from here. I can't read it from here either. Um, anyway, what this says, and I hope the people at home can read that, what it says is that testosterone is not about aggression. It's about striving for status. That's what they're saying. This is Eisenhower, um, 2011, I think, they started talking about this kind of thing. It is absolutely fascinating. Very important for us to know as men. Okay, what increases your testosterone? You start thinking about competing, your testosterone goes up. Did you know that? Winning, 
when you win, let me see that picture. Oh, there it is. There it is. You win. Look at this guy. He's up in the air. Up, up, up. Everybody's up. Win, win, win. You're looking at a football game, right? After the game, after someone scores a touchdown, everybody's high five. Yeah, yeah. The other team's like, gravity's pulling them down. Testosterone's pushing those up. The more you win, the more your testosterone goes up. Ovulating women. When you smell an ovulating woman, your testosterone goes up. You can imagine that? Just from the smell. An angry face, to most people, means, uh-oh, this is a problem. But to those with high testosterone, an angry face means a challenge. Hmm. When a woman comes to you, you're having a fight with your spouse, right? She's, she's saying, oh, no. And you're saying, no, I'm not doing that. She starts crying. Guess what happens? As soon as she starts crying, your testosterone goes down. <laughs> Think about that one. That's tricky piece. So there's all kinds of things that no one's ever told you about with testosterone. Now, um, adding on to this, there's this thing called precarious manhood. Because really, what we find is that testosterone is fuel. It's like the fuel, but what's it fuel for? It's fuel for what these people are calling Precarious manhood. Precarious manhood. Let's see what they say about this. The status of men is often challenged. The status of women is not. The status of men is often challenged. The status of women is not. When a little girl is born and she goes through puberty, she is from that point forward considered a woman. When a little boy is born and he goes through puberty, he's not considered a man. He has to prove that he's a man. He has to prove it through public displays. That's what they've found with this precarious manhood thing. All over the world, it's the same thing. Every place they've gone, they've found that boys have to prove they are men. It's very, very important for us to know. Because now we understand testosterone is fueling this whole precarious manhood thing, right? And it pushes the precarious manhood stuff, and it's our striving for status pushes us into that mode, right? And the men, ugh, where were we? Sorry about that. Manhood must be earned. Womanhood is ascribed. Manhood is tenuous and it can be lost and taken away. Manhood is determined by others and requires public demonstrations of proof. Uh, okay, do you know what they're talking about here? When they talk about precarious manhood, they're talking about the male dominance hierarchy. They just don't know it yet. Probably in three to five years they'll figure it out because what is this? Why would there be all this judgment of men? There's only one reason. Because it's putting men into tiers of value. That's what the dominance hierarchy does. Puts men into tiers of value. With how valuable you are going to be to the tribe, those men are at the top. Those men who have less value for the tribe, think a catcher, he might be here. But if you don't have any skill at all, you're down at the bottom. So we're pushed into this place where our culture is testing men every day. Now, one of the things they've noticed about this is that this creates anxiety for men. I mean, think about it. If you're going into a test, right? You're going into a test, how do you feel? Most of us feel a little nervous, right? You get out of the test, ah, relax. Well, guess what? Men are tested every day. So they're seeing that men's anxiety over this gender role piece is much higher than women's. And guys, if you're 24, 25, 26, and you've got a lot of anxiety and you can't figure out where it's coming from, it's probably partly due to this. Okay, now here comes another one. Oh good, we can read this. Although, we, this is the researchers talking, okay? So think about this, this is the researchers. They say, although we can only conjecture at this point, we believe that many of the specific anxieties and behaviors associated with manhood and assessed with values, measures of gender role conflict, arise because of the elusiveness and impermanence of manhood. Do you get what they're saying there? This is critical. They're saying, now we understand why men do these things. Because they're doing it because of precarious manhood. This is a completely different way of seeing the world of men. And we need to hear more about this stuff. But they go on. The precariousness of manhood, for example, can explain why men value status and achievement, why they display traits such as assertiveness and dominance, and why they engage in risky and aggressive behaviors. So precarious manhood theory is understanding why men do what they do. Completely different from our friends, 
the feminists, oh here, got a little bit in there, feminine in their appearance. Um, avoid femininity in their appearance, personality, and conduct. Yes, we'll avoid feminine stuff. Why? Because of precarious manhood. As soon as you look feminine, boom, you drop down in the hierarchy. You go down to zero. Oh, jeez. Um, and experience anxiety and stress when they fail to achieve cultural standards of masculinity. I don't know why this thing just started to work, but it did. Let's see. Okay, and we've talked about this a little bit. It's the testosterone that fuels this precarious manhood by striving for status, lowering fears, increasing risk-taking, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, precarious manhood, I think, equals hierarchy. But what is hierarchy for men? They see it all the time. When you're in the military, you wear the hierarchy on your sleeve. You've got more stripes, you tell other people what to do. You've got less stripes, you do what they say to do, right? We see hierarchy every place in men's work. You know, scoreboards, sports statistics. How many men like sports stats? I love sports stats. Why? It's gauging who's first, second, third, fourth, fifth. It's where we live. We live in this hierarchy thing, right? Okay. Um, stock market, same thing. Who's first, second, third, fourth, fifth? Can you see how this is the meat of men's blue pill world? There it is, right there. It's this whole hierarchy thing. And as a man, I enjoy this stuff, you know? It's okay. Okay. Um, so that's one way of viewing masculinity, but look at... Uh, Jordan Peterson says, toxic masculinity is an attempt to smear masculinity by confusing masculine competence with tyranny. By confusing masculine competence with tyranny. And that takes us to this slide. Oh, oh that's a shame. Now I don't have any more secrets left. That's all right. The first one, toxic masculinity. Men are toxic because they avoid feminine behaviors. Precarious manhood says, we understand that men will avoid feminine behaviors. You see how it's working? The toxic masculinity say, men are too competitive. But the precarious manhood people say, be, we understand that men will be very competitive. Men are too dominant, they say. Men are going to move towards dominance. Too status-oriented. Men are going to strive for status. Take too many risks and are too aggressive. Engage in risky and aggressive behaviors. Wow. Can you see the difference? And you know what blows my mind is that Vandello is the researcher that did a lot of the uh, precarious manhood stuff. He got an award from Division 51 in 2014 for his research, which is, sort of scratches my head because the Division 51 people are very much into socialization. That's the only thing that caused. And I'm, I guess they thought that he was talking about this is only socialized. What they don't get, if they believe that, is it's testosterone. It's the fuel for this. Testosterone is the fuel. And as men, we need to start to become conscious of testosterone. We start to become conscious of precarious manhood. Because when we are conscious of those things, we can start to take some conscious actions that are red pill instead of blue pill. And we need to also be aware of them because we can feel that pull back, that pull back from the blue pill testosterone that pulls us back to that place where we value ourselves only because of what we do. And trust me, men are good because they have value in their being. And that's enough for today. Thank you all very much. Men are good. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions, yes? Questions. Questions. Questions? OK. Uh, this is, um, I hope I don't knock anything over. Hi there. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I would say that there is almost nothing in, I would say there is almost nothing in our society that is purely negative or purely positive. Yes. It only depends on how it's um, challenge, um, channeled. Sure. And I would say all these behaviors can be at the same time very positive for our society and very negative in our society. Absolutely. Um, it's these behaviors that have built our culture. Yeah. The thing is, um, we need to address how to work with these natural um, testosterone-driven behaviors and um, shape them in a constructive way that we don't suffer under them. Yes. And 
But I think the tricky thing is men that don't want to be part of this hierarchy driven um, culture, they need the chance to opt, opt out without being um, ridiculed. Yes. While the other people, um, the other men that want to strive for that um, should also not be scrutinized what happens at the moment with feminism. Absolutely. When I arrived yesterday here in America, I'm from Germany, I live in the UK, um, I talked to a friend and I said, uh, men here in America are much more masculine than in uh, Germany and in the UK, I would say. And there are much more male role models in sports and they are more masculine. Hmm. And I'm wondering if this um, actually, this positive portrayal of masculinity um, also puts the men that don't have this portrayal of masculinity into a really precarious situation. And with the mass shooters, for example, um, the ones that are being bullied because they are not jocks, um, because they are nerds, um, I think we see potentially a bit more of that here in America than for example, in Germany. And I think even though it's great that men are being portrayed positive in the media here, it puts a lot of pressure on men. And I think we need to try to find a balance between that. What do you think about that? I agree 100%. You know, we need to be compassionate towards, it, towards all. Whether they want to um, uh, strive for status, whether they're MGTOW, I mean, we need to love them all. You know, if men want to be in the hierarchy, I salute you. Men want to be MGTOW, I salute you twice. You know. And that's just the way things are, and we gotta love them all. So yeah, you're singing my song, man. I like that. Hi, Tom. It's uh, Ken Jolivet hey, uh, from London. Although I'm American, I just live and work there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, have you thought about testosterone and, let's say, mental disease? In a sense, follow me. We didn't understand mental illness psychotic and what have you in the 60s, 70s, and they were electrocuting them and what have you. It's my thesis and theory that um, men who have high testosterone are going to be seen as those kind of people back then that we know, that we understand now about mental illness. High testosterone men, they're the majority of the people in jail, uh, they commit most of the crimes, especially sexual crimes and what have you. So it's my thesis that, and what do you think about it, that one day we'll understand that men with high testosterone have a certain thing like what you're pointing out. It's no surprise to me, um, because I grew up with very high testosterone and still have for 55 years old. I understand all these things. It's like second nature. Yeah. So what do you think about men in high testosterone versus a mental illness kind of discovery that uh, we're not we're not sick. We're I just think, high testosterone. Yeah, so exactly. how do you treat us? Well said. We're not sick with high testosterone. Testosterone is just a hormone. I mean, it's what we have. It's, it's a natural thing. It's like women have ovaries. Although I've heard many people say that uh, women overreacting, but um, that's, <laughs> that's another thing altogether. You know, and I don't I don't see any connection between testosterone and mental illness. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see that. I just see it as a hormone. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the you know, if you look at what's out there today with the mental health, people, ooh, someone's going to shoot me for that. The uh, the mental health people don't like this idea of testosterone. You're absolutely right, and they're going to try and frame it in the worst of terms possible. Tom, this is Paul here. There's something I didn't tell you last night when we were having drinks, and that uh -oh. I've decided to become a feminist. <laughs> okay. We love you for that. After Paul. listening to you and all this male bullshit, I've decided to become a feminist. And let me give it to you straight, like I would talk, you know, from the feminist perspective. Take these, either one of these charts, precarious men. Uh, this, these traits have evolved in the Stone Age when yeah. our ancestors were, you know, making the transition from hunter-gatherer peoples to agricultural nomadic peoples. These qualities are irrelevant to life today in the society in which we live. We now have that machines that can do what male labor did before. There's no reason to have, in fact, any of the men in this room. All we need is a few sperm donors to fertilize women 
and we would get rid of nuclear war, racial discrimination, misogyny, all of the things that are wrong in society can be traced to these qualities, right? Okay, okay, these, these qualities. So, oh, in fact, we don't really need you and me. All we need is Brad Pitt and, you know, a few oh, people like that. So, oh, how would you oh. answer me, Tom? I want an honest oh. answer. Why do they need us? I think you have a bad case of toxic femininity. <laughs> That's all I'll say. To toxic feminism. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more. Oh, wait, Russell, you, you, uh, you had your hand up. Okay. Uh, Tom, just a quick one. Um, you said... You, you have to Eat the mic. <laughs> you said that to uh, testosterone is not about aggression as much as striving for status. Right. What's the difference? What's the difference? Yeah, it seems like aggression striving for status in involves in aggression. Aggression is when someone punches you in the face. I'm talking about violence, you know? Someone who's going to push you around, bust you up. Striving for status means they're going to look for ways to increase their status in the social sphere. You know, it's a big, big difference. Especially when violence is actually not approved of in a social sphere. Yeah, I, I, just my understanding of, of uh, the understanding of aggression is that it's not just violence. Well, that's certainly true. Look at relational aggression, you know, which no one will look at. The media won't look at it, you know. I did a good video on that. Okay, I think we have time for one more, two, if everybody's quick. Yeah, you, can, you can pass it to Brandon. He had the exact same question as me between aggression and violence. All right, okay, so here we go. Robin Davis, thank you very much. What about, can you comment on declining testosterone rates? Yeah, you know, I think that there's declining testosterone rates, and there's a lot of guesses about why that is. I think that we... Um, Oh, what's that stuff called? The plastics. Endocrine disruptors are probably a big part of it. You know, do people know about endocrine disruptors? Oh, boy. I hate to tell you about it because it's depressing. But basically, almost all of our products have plastics in them, and that emits certain uh, endocrines. And part of it is estrogen stuff. So this estrogen is, is keeping boys. Boys don't have puberty now until, you know, 13 or 14. Girls are having puberty at 7 or 8, 9 years old. And they're thinking that also is related to this stuff with the endocrine disruptors, which is pushing more estrogen into the environment. So I think it's environmental in a lot of ways. You know, we'll see. Okay, uh, we have an exception here because the owner of the and founder of the conference wants to ask you a question. So, uh, but try to make it quick. The Paul. chief patriarch. Yeah, just a, a quick comment. Um, our guest here from Germany. Uh, implied that we needed a way to moderate uh, these tendencies in men for aggression and other things. I just wanted to say we already have that. It, they're called fathers. Yes. Uh, and it's, we, do, we can't forget that, that fathers are the grounding factor in how all these tendencies in men get acted out in adult so life. So true. So true. And think about a family where the father's gone and the boy's going through this thing where he's getting boosted to testosterone in precarious manhood. What does he do? Mom doesn't know jack about that. She doesn't know the first thing, so she's going to shame him for it. You know, the father would know something about it. And he'd, he'd settle him down, you know? So Paul's exactly right. Fatherlessness is a man-made curse. You know, we literally have, have made something that is just tearing us apart. All right, Tom. We're finished. Thank you all. Excellent, excellent presentation. I'm so, uh, I'm so happy that you decided to talk about testosterone because it really is a misunderstood hormone, and uh, and I just think it's a lot of inf it's information that a lot of people should really be thinking about. Um, we are going to adjourn for a short break. We will reconvene at. 11 o'clock on the dot people um, for our panel on the uh, testosterone poisoned uh, adolescent boys who are the uh, new face of hate in America, the Covington Catholic School boys. So um, that will be a panel discussion and I will see you there uh, in 15 minutes.